God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I want to welcome you here to First Christian Church. And as always, every time we meet, we're here because Jesus is alive. Amen. He's here with us. And that's why we're here. We're going to worship him. Amen. And we want to welcome you. If you're a visitor here, please take a card in the pew in front of you. Fill it out. Put it in the offering plate. If anybody has a prayer request, uh, do the same. Uh, we pray for these folks. I promise you that. It's good to see everybody. A uh, lot going on today. First of all, I want to say Joanne Rock is back in church with us. Amen. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Looking mighty good, too, I might add. So we're glad you're back. And, and also, I think Janelle Ratliff has a birthday today. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> huh? You want to sing to her? Yeah. Well, some, uh, I'm not starting. <laughs> Thank you. 
practice this song a little bit more. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> Let's just start and begin. <laughs> this time we come to recognize what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. And around this table, this is where we are to do that. As far as I'm concerned, around this table is the focal point of our service today. This is a point where we're to put aside everything that previously was on our mind. You've heard various ones of us as we come up here. We've asked each one of you to, to put aside the cares of the world, put aside the, the problems that you might be facing, 
And then we want you to put aside when you're sitting here thinking about what you're going to have today for lunch. Because this is a special time. This is a time that our hearts should be keyed in on nothing more than what Jesus has done for us. We have all read from the various scriptures about the breaking of the bread and the serving of the cup and what it represents, the blood and body of our Christ. We've also read about Christ doing it and Christ telling us to do this in remembrance of him. We're very much aware that the first Christians gathered together for the partaking of the Lord's Supper. That in itself should show, show us just how extremely important it is that we gather together in remembrance of Lord of Jesus Christ who went to the Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. But you know, in, in, in with all the, the Bible reading and the scriptures that we've read concerning that partaking, you know, in, in adding to what we should do, there is another scripture that I'd like to read this morning from the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning at, beginning at verse 15. And it's a warning, okay? This shows us, after I read this, you're going to see how critically important it is that we as Christians meet around the Lord's table each and every Lord's day. But this is a warning telling us, just emphasizing a little bit more on what our hearts should be thinking about. And there again, what our hearts should not be thinking about. Beginning at verse 15, it says, I speak to the sensible people, judge for yourself what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifice participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything or that any idol is anything? No. But the sacrifice of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to participate with the demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons at the same time. You cannot have a part in the body of the Lord's table in the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? <laughs> Therein again, just again, it really to me emphasizes the importance of having our heart where it should be at this very special time. Let us pray. Our dear and most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you at this time as we participate in the blood and body of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing and accepting and acknowledging the fact, Lord, that Jesus went to the cross for each and every one of us. During that moment in which you had left him, he was experiencing the sins of the world, my sin and the sins of my brothers. He was experiencing these sins, Lord, in order to be a washing away in order to shed his blood for the washing away of our sins. Knowing, Lord, that from that day forward, if we come to know and accept him as our Lord and Savior, that we too might have the hope of eternal life. That we too have satisfied what we need to do as Christians. Knowing that nothing else that we can do in this world could ever add up to qualifying us to be servants of God or, or enter into the gates of heaven. Nothing other than the shed blood of Jesus Christ because through Jesus we can get there. And without Jesus, there's no way that we can meet our eternal glory. I ask just now, Lord, for thanks for those that participate this day. I pray, Lord, that each of us might receive a special blessing. That each of us might in our hearts feel a closer walk with Jesus. Go with us now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.
come to this portion of our service, I again want to add comment that this is another important part of our service. This is a part that we can give back that to the Lord, that which He has given to us. You know, in our daily prayers, it seems like we come asking for our needs. We want this, we need that. We pray for this, we pray for that. And you know, that's, a, that's perfectly fine. I'm not saying anything negative against that. But also, involved in our daily prayers should be us being able to come to the Lord and just thanking Him, not asking for nothing. Just thanking Him for what He's done for us. And I consider this another opportunity in order to physically thank the Lord for what he's done for us. This is a way that we can physically give back to the Lord that which he has given to us. And you know, so often we take that for granted. I mean, we, we take the money and we buy our groceries and we pay our bills. But very seldom do we actually receive money that we really up here think about where it comes from. You know, uh, you say, some people say, yeah, but I work for it. Yes, but God gave you the ability to work for it. You know, God gave you the know-how to work for it. God has blessed us in so many ways, so many ways that we can sit up here and just start naming the ways that he's blessed us and just go on and on. And I'm sure every one of us in here could come up with something new that nobody else has mentioned that God has blessed us with, you know. But how often do we actually go to God and thank God for those blessings? We, uh, as humans, we've got one real bad characteristic. We take too many things for granted. We just assume that it's going to be there, and we really don't focus on and thank the one that actually did the giving. So at this time, as we dig into our pockets, all of you are aware of where this money goes. I don't have to sit up here and say it's for the ongoing of the church here and it pays the light bills and all that. You already know that, okay? But I want to tell you something that you already know that you just really don't think about. And that is, this money that you put into this trade, where did it come from? If you honestly get right down to it, it didn't come from universal fibers. It came from what the Lord blessed me with. Okay, and all of us have got that. All of us have got the same thing if we sit down and think about it and recognize it. All of us have to recognize the fact that everything we have from the breath you just took was a blessing from God. Let us pray. Dear God, as we come to you at this time, we and I really want to come thanking you for what you've done for us. Lord, I can't stand up here today and name over all the countless blessings that you've given to me as well as to my brothers and sisters. Lord, all of those blessings that you've given to us are, are a numerous. They're more than we can count. But Lord, at this special time, at this special place, I pray that each one of us would just give you a thanks. A thanks for each and everything that you've done for us. Those things that we know of, those things that we don't know of, those things that we forgot. I pray thanks to you, Lord, for all that you have blessed us with. Now go with us now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
facing sickness, and they're, they're facing these illnesses, Lord, and they're trying to be restored. We pray that you restore them to health and soothe their pain and ease their life and their worry. Lord, we pray that you will take care of these people, take care of the caregivers who also are going through many problems. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. Good morning. I left out two announcements. You could read them. But it's hard to believe that May is only two weeks away. And on May the 3rd, uh, the group 64 to Grayson will be here leading our worship. And also on that day, we're going to start a men's prayer breakfast once a month. We're going to try it. We're going to meet at 830 and have a breakfast together, and then we're going to pray for what goes on in the church uh, that day and every day. And the breakfast will be really good because Randy Newberry is cooking it. So I know you were worried about that. You thought I was going to cook, but no, I'm not. It's Randy, so it'll be fine. So anyway, keep that on your calendars, too. Hey, let's stand, greet each other. Hunter's class will go downstairs. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
get greeted warmly. They're still greet warm. part two of a little mini-series on grace. In fact, if you look at your bulletin, and you'll see it up here, the, the title of the message is actually a question. Is grace fair? No. The invitation hymn will now be sung. <laughs> no, it's not. We're, we're going to look at that. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, I ask that you be with us. Speak through me, Lord whatever you want to have happen here today. May the Spirit move in a mighty way. May lives be changed. May you be glorified. In Christ's name, amen. I read a story the other day about a, a court jester. Of course, this is back in the medieval times. You know, he was a court jester, you know, one of those guys wearing them funny hats and dances around, makes the king laugh, so forth and so on. Well, anyway, he made a mistake one day. He offended the king. And the king was so mad that he sentenced this court jester to be executed. Well, the buddies of the jester and all the people of the court, you know, they went to the king and they begged him for mercy. He said, king, you know, this guy served you for years and years and he's not a bad guy. He just made a mistake. And the king, thinking that he was a merciful man, says, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, uh, bring him on in here. <coughs> so they brought the court jester in before the king. He says, since I'm a merciful king, I'm going to give you the choice of how you want to die. And the jester said, well, if it's all right with you, I'd like to die of old age. <laughs> <laughs> so remember that. So, uh, our king is merciful also, isn't he? Maybe he is. That's what we're going to talk about today. He's merciful. You know, we, we talked last week about grace. It was unmerited favor. You know, getting mercy when we deserve punishment. You know, we can't buy it. We can't earn it. It's a gift. And mercy goes hand in hand with grace. It really does. But, you know, if you think about it, and I've thought a lot about this, it's really hard for us to wrap our heads around this concept. You know, you ever notice how mercy is something that we really want when we are the recipients? But we're not so hot about it when somebody else gets it. Maybe even ahead of us. You know, that's not fair! We cry. You know, even when we're kids, you know, we see this. You know, hey, that piece of pie! You know, your little brother says, that piece of pie is bigger than mine! Why? Am I happy for my brother? Why, no. I want that pie. I want a piece as big or bigger. It's not fair. We, we don't want mercy then. We want justice. But if it comes our way, we're okay with the mercy. You know, when, when something good happens to someone else, are we happy for them? Well, I hope so. But sometimes we're jealous, aren't we? We really are. Jesus tells a parable that we're going to look at today that hits right on this nerve. He hits right on this nerve. It's a parable about a generous boss and some unhappy workers and a few happy ones. And this parable is found in Matthew chapter 20, starting at verse 1. Jesus talking. He said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those who were hired first came, they expected to receive more. 
But each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who is hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Wow. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, this parable, it's pretty clear what Jesus is talking about. The landowner is God. The workers are us, people, and the pay is the kingdom of God. You know, some workers started at 6 o'clock in the morning and worked all day long. Others began at 9 o'clock in the morning. Some were hired at noon. Some at 3 in the afternoon. And finally, the last ones were hired at 5 o'clock, just an hour before quitting time. And they all got the same pay. You know, the workers who had worked all day, they weren't happy. Well, no wonder. Would you be? But they received what was agreed upon. See, they, they agreed to the day's pay. The landowner explained that he was not being unfair. He was being generous. He was being merciful. He was exhibiting grace towards the people who had started later in the day. You know what? He had a right to do so because he's the boss. You know, this landowner today, you know, if you, if you would put this in reality today, man, this guy would be in big trouble, wouldn't he? I mean, he would be in big trouble, especially with the labor unions. Can you imagine the labor unions, you know, you know, going to this guy? Well, the next morning, you'd have pickets all over his vineyard. Unfair wage practices, you know, down with this boss. What's the matter with it? Of course, you have a few guys that were really happy, you know, the ones that started. But most of them say, it's not fair. It's not fair. We worked all day. What kind of boss is this? You know, he might have trouble getting people to work in the morning tomorrow morning with that kind of attitude. You know, but he was being generous. And he could do it because he was in charge. But it doesn't always work that way in real life because we're human and we're fallen. You know, back in 1971, I went to work one summer <laughs> while I was in college at the steel mill near Pittsburgh. Now, I know some of you are saying, 1971, you're not even that old. You weren't even born yet, were you? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> But I was. I was old enough to go work in a steel mill. Well, to, back then, for me to work in a steel mill, even for a summer, I had to be a card-carrying member of the United Steelworkers of America, which I was for three months. The interesting thing that summer while I was there was the summer that the labor negotiations between the union and the, you know, the mill were coming to an end. And so they were talking about going on strike. And I remember, you know, I'm a 19-year-old kid or 20, whatever it was, and, uh, and I'm just caught up. I'm just, you know, summer help, you know, and, and they're talking about the, they wanted this and they wanted more benefits and the pay and this and that and the other thing. And I'm, that's fine with me. Well, anyway, the, the negotiations were not going well. And I remember they were bringing in food, you know, in trains to, to the guys that were going to stay, the company people. And I remember this old timer that came up to me the day before the strike was to start. And he said, Tommy, let me tell you something. I said, what's that? He said, if you come to work tomorrow morning and there's a picket line, don't you dare cross it. I said, well, I wasn't planning on it. You know, but he said, because they will hurt you. I said, wow. It was serious business. And it really was. Fortunately, that night, the negotiations, you know, they were able to work things out. And there was no strike. But I got to see, you know, that they, they demanded fairness and justice. You know, wanting this and that. And that's fine. But the other thing I learned at working in the mill that summer was that there were other times when they had a holiday, like the 4th of July. 
And some of the guys would get paid for the 4th of July as a benefit without working. I got to thinking about this. Well, that wasn't fair either, was it? I mean, to get paid for a day you did not work at all, is that not unfair? But nobody complained about that. I had not one complaint. You know, say, hey, I, I'm sorry, I can't take this pay because I didn't work that day. See, that's the way we are in, in the reality as human beings. You know, we want mercy when it's applied to us if it's to our benefit. But if it's against us and somebody else gets something, then we want justice. And Jesus is talking about this in this parable. You know, it's, it's really an incredible thing. You know, and I think sometimes we have this same attitude towards God. You know, every day we get blessings like food and clothing and shelter. You know, I look around here, you know, we're all fed. We all got nice clothes on. We probably all drove up here in vehicles. We probably got homes to go home to. You know, and we sort of take that for granted, don't we? And then there's people who live like that. But then if something bad happens, like on 9-11 of 01, then these people say, where's your God now? Where is he now? Oh, you great God. How come he wasn't merciful then? Where is he? See, that they, they will overlook the mercies and the blessings every day that God gives us without even thinking about it. But one time, or any time they think something is taken away. Where are you? It's not fair, God. What's the matter with you? That's the way we are. It's not really very good of us, is it? And so in this parable, here was a boss. You know, he could have done whatever he wanted to do. And he chose to be merciful and generous, just like our God is to us. You know, what do we deserve? You know, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Be very careful when you ask God for justice. Be very, very careful. I read this story, and I shared this before several years ago, but I love it. You know, it's about uh, the former mayor of New York City. You know, his name was Fiorello LaGuardia. You know, and you know that name because LaGuardia Airport is named after this guy. And he was mayor of New York City during the Depression in the World War II years. He was called, the nickname was the Little Flower. The man stood five foot four. And he always wore a carnation in his thing. They called him the Little Flower. You know, and he was really a colorful kind of character. You know, he would ride the New York City fire trucks with the firemen. You know, he would raid speakeasies with the police department. He would take entire orphanages to ball games in New York City. And when the newspapers were on strike, he would go to the radio station and read the funny papers over the radio so the kids wouldn't miss out on the day's funnies. People loved him. Well, one night, it's told, in 1935, a real bad cold night in January, the mayor turned up at a night court. And it was, a, it was serving the poorest ward of New York City. And the mayor, LaGuardia, dismissed the judge and said, you go on home, the weather's bad, I'll take care of the rest of the cases. Within a few minutes, an old woman, tattered and poor, this was during the Depression, remind, remember, this old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread because her grandchildren were starving. Her husband, daughter's husband had deserted her, her daughter was sick, and the kids were really hungry, so she stole a loaf of bread from a local shopkeeper. Well, the shopkeeper who was there refused to drop the charges. He said to the, to the mayor, who was the sitting judge, he said, you know, it's a rough neighborhood, Your Honor. We've got to teach people not to do this. It's wrong, and we need to make an example of this lady. She's got to be punished so other people don't do it. LaGuardia took a deep sigh, and he turned to the woman and said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. But even as he was pronouncing the sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. He took a ten dollar bill and put it in the hat and said, here's the ten dollar fine which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this courtroom fifty cents 
for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. The following day, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her grandchildren. 50 cents of that being contributed by the grocery store owner from whom the bread was stolen. <laughs> and petty criminals, traffic violators, and even New York City policemen, <coughs> each who had just paid 50 cents for the privilege of doing so, and they gave the mayor in that courtroom a standing ovation. Now listen, that's another sort of parable in itself, isn't it? Did the old woman in the story get what she deserved? She did not. She did not. She had stolen a loaf of bread. It's a crime to do that. She may have had good reason. It may have been a very noble thing. But regardless of that, she had stolen and deserved to be punished. You know, this is what grace looks like. When someone in superior power shows kindness or mercy to someone in a lesser position, you know, Mayor LaGuardia, you know, rather than demanding punishment of the woman, paid the fine himself and then furthered her cause so it could be given to her. It was more than she deserved. It was grace. It was grace. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Someone else paying a debt? Me and you deserving punishment, deserving an everlasting hell, that's what we deserve. And yet someone, the name is Jesus, comes and says, I'll pay. I'll pay. Not, not only am I going to pay, but I'm going to give you everything else too. I'm going to give you an abundant life. I'm going to give you blessings that you never even imagined. But I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Yes. It's called grace. Now the question is, do you ever complain to God that you want him to treat you fairly? Don't do that. Don't ever ask God to give you what you deserve. Believe me, you and I do not want justice on judgment day. We want mercy. We want grace. If we get justice, will be lost forever. You know, the parable in the Bible we read, you know, talks to many people who maybe seem like it's not fair because I've been working in the church all my life. I've been working in the church all my life. In fact, I have perfect attendance since 1942. I deserve more. I deserve more than this guy who's a sinner out here. Well, there's a drunkard in town, and by golly, he gave his life to the Lord the other day, was baptized, and only been a Christian in a week. Are you going to get the same as me? He's going to get salvation? Yes. We're not talking about rewards here and all that stuff. We're talking about the gift of salvation. Does he earn it? No. Does he deserve it? No. Do you? No. Do I? No. It's called grace. It comes from a, a God who can give it if he wants to, whether you or I like it or not. That's what it is. Let's never be like that older brother in that other parable that we read once in a while called the prodigal son. You remember the wild child boy. You know, he takes his father's inheritance and he goes off to a far country and he's whining and dying. He's, he's got prostitutes and everything else. He's eating pig slop and he comes to his senses and he goes home full of remorse. Broken man. He's broken. And the father, who should be offended, what's he do? He's looking for him every day. And when the boy comes, he's rejoicing. He's so happy that the boy has come to his senses in his home. He throws a party. He kills the fatted calf. But the older brother, the older brother, you know, from a human perspective, you know, he, he deserved more, didn't he? I mean, he was there the whole time. He was working the farm. He didn't go off wasting money. And he's mad about it. So, Dad. I don't get it, man. 
I've stayed here the whole time working, and, and this younger brother, he's out there with prostitutes wasting his inheritance. It's called grace. It's called mercy. We should be happy about it. We really should. I believe we as Christians, we should be leading the parade when a sinner comes to Christ. Amen. After all, isn't that what we are too? Sinners in need of a Savior? Ephesians 2. Listen to this. This is Paul. And he knew something about sin. He called himself the chief of sinners. You know, he, he had a rough past. He knew what sin was. And here's what he says. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you are saved. So the question we asked at the beginning, and now we're asking again, is grace fair? Is grace fair? Thank God the answer is no. It's merciful. You know, in light of God's mercy towards us, I want to ask us each today, in light of his mercy and grace, is there someone you know to whom you need to show some mercy, some grace, some forgiveness, some restoration? After all, Jesus said this himself in Matthew 7, 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Let's pray. Lord, I can't thank you enough for grace. I need it. I really do, and everybody here does. I thank you, Father, that you are merciful to us sinners. We don't deserve what you've done for us. But you are the God of the universe, and you choose to extend mercy to us. And for that, I am so grateful. I pray, Lord, for someone here today that does not know this grace, this mercy, does not know you as Savior, that today they would take full advantage of this great offer that is extended to all. To believe this word and to, to repent of our past, to confess you as Savior, to be baptized into Christ, to live a faithful life as best we can in service of you. We give you honor and glory until you call us home and you come and get us. I pray today would be the day People that don't know you need to come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing. If you have a need today, please come. Let's stand. <clears throat>
love you. Keep praying for each other. This Wednesday, we're gonna we are our two classes will be ending our parenting class and uh, the spiritual warfare class. And so next Wednesday, next week, we'll have a movie night and then we'll start a new series in May. So mark that on your calendars. Hope you have a great day. Wilbur and Cadle, would you close in prayer? Thank you. Father in heaven, we thank you for this privilege that we've had to gather in your house today. Father, we pray that each